and hello to everybody out there watching. Welcome to another majestic update about my painting progress. I'm Doc Ian. It's Monday, the 19th of October. You're looking at a some sort of marker for games. I, I you know, this is a, a rune stone from a basing kit that I decided instead of making it, you know, having having as a separate el an element of a bigger base, I decided to make a couple of separate markers for them. They could be, I don't know, ski markers from Alifo or something, since they're on these 30 mil look bases. I just felt like painting some terrain. And in the background, you can see my, uh, I, I've, I've included in some of my recent videos, some, some ruminations about how to do bases. And I finished the examples I showed you. This, is a, this one is a 40 millimeter, lip base. These are 30 millimeters and these are your basic 25 millimeter unlipped bases, so to speak. I don't actually have anything in mind. I Honestly, I don't have any particular models in mind for them. So we'll just have to see what they get used for. Now, uh, Next up, some actual miniatures. Now, uh, these aren't very much to look at in their current state. Uh, I just wanted you to know that I've begun working on these two minis again. So I've been laying down some more undercoats, or base coats, you might say, and uh, doing preparatory work. Uh, there is a lot of very intricate detail on these two ladies. So they're gonna take some time if I'm gonna do them right. I mean, I thought I would just base coat the hair and it turns out once I start putting some paint to them, it's not just hair. They're, they're, most models just have hair, but these have hair that's full of little details, little braids, little ringlets here, a skull there, and little medallions that are probably metal. Here and there, it's just and and also painting the skin is not a simple task either because well you you would think that oh well, there's a lot of bare skin that's simple just paint all over it but no they have these anklets and armlets and uh, chains and things you need to consider before just slopping skin tone all over it so. It's going to take time to do these right, but I ha again I've, I've cleared just about everything else apart from uh, the bones and, and spooky topper projects from my table. So getting work done. And we've completed the Numenera bones minis. Already? Well, it they were kind of a rush job. They were not given a lot of tender loving care, but, you know, fake it till you make it. I just did them as quickly as possible while still making them look reasonably effective. Um... This one looks really weird, but that's because I went with the scheme from the rule book of, you know, golden body, blue hair, blue head, sorry, which looks a bit weird. This one is more simpler, more monotone, as is this one. Well, it's two tone. It's the green and the reddish pink. This one is mostly sort of orange, yellow, except for the writer, and some metal bits. Painted the flying stand blue, make it look like sky, and yeah. I don't know that when I will ever use these, but hey, now they're done, they're out of the way, on to the next thing. <sighs> so these guys are prepped. Uh, I cleaned, straightened out, assembled, and primed them. I 
did not bother to do any gap filling. I, because, you know, who's going to notice? Honestly, once they're painted, how many people are going to notice there's a seam in this shoulder but not in this one? It's the kind of detail that only a, 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 an obsessive painter <laughs> notices. And these these are really, you know, I, I've said this before, but with these, these big monsters, I almost don't mind that they're bones. It's kind of a pity. I mean, resin would have been better, but or hard plastic for that matter. But yeah, it, it works because when it's this thick, it's not so soft anymore. It, it is almost hard plastic. It's just that cleanup is is a bitch. Um, and I'd like to uh, show you some history of these creatures, what where they're from. They are, as I've mentioned previously, from D and D. Um, if we go back all the way to the original Monster Manual, and we turn to the chapter on demons. No, not that far. Here we go. Here we have the Type 2 Demon. Seem familiar? Yeah. That's him. And up here we have the Type 4 Demon, which is clearly this guy. Now, the names I've mentioned previously are in parentheses. It says here Nalfeshni, etc. It says uh, Glabrezu. That it says etc. means that um, type 4 demons and above are supposed to have individual names. All of them. Is Nafashni is not supposed to be the name of a of a race of demons. It's it's supposed to be the, just one singular demon who has that name. Um, and uh, th this is connected to the idea that true names have power. And if you, if a, as a wizard or something, you find out the name of a true name of a demon, you get some power over it. So this was a thing in early D and D that you had to find out the names of demons. But later on, they got lazy and just made this the name of the species of demon. For example, the same thing with the Marlith, the type 5 demon, and the type 6 demon became called the Balor, simply. Now, these black and white illustrations, while I like them, are not of any help when painting. So, let's look at a later edition of the Monster Manual. This is the third edition, or 3.5. And here we have another image of the Glabrezu, which is kind of beefier. And it's kind of color-wise not very interesting. It's just kind of muddled. It's just all colors running into each other. Um, here we have the Nalfashni, who is barely any better. Let's see. You can sort of tell that the fur is a darker color than the skin, but that's about it. Moving on to... Where are we? The fourth edition Monster Manual, I, I, uh, which looks like this. Still the best image of Orcus ever made. Uh, however, the Glabrezo is not as inspiring. He's just a big red dude. This is honestly a boring image. Uh, I, I I don't have a copy of the second edition Monster Manual, by the way. I used to have I back in the day I had that old uh, loose leaf format binder thing, but I I think I sold it or something at some point. Anyway, sidetracked. As a Glabrezo in. To find a picture of the Nalfeshni, we have to go all the way to uh, the Monster Manual 3, which has a nice image of Loth on the cover. And here, now we're starting to get some artwork that's interesting. This guy, he's, uh, he has some color separation. He has uh, some pink and, and pink skin with 
red gashes and a sort of dark brownish purplish black fur, kind of black wings. Now this we can work with. This is inspiring. But overall, I would say that the best images are actually in the newest, the fifth edition Master Manual. Here we have Rick Brezo with some color separation. He has sort of um, pinkish gray hide and the reddish fur. The red is kept from, from the previous illustrations. They've kept the red uh, color, but for the, for the fur. And if you look at this model, you can see that he has certain areas that are textured like fur and others like the chest and the arms that seem to be bare skin. So this can work, painting two different colors. And let's see if we can find the Narfashni in this book. And here he is. He looks pretty much like in 4th edition. Um, I actually think this this miniature model is better than the picture in in terms of uh, proportions. I like it better, uh, but it has the same same idea of of separating the color of the fur from the skin. So I'm gonna take this book as my guide, primarily when painting them. Let's see how close I can get. As has become my tradition, I will close out the bones section by showing you the next set in line to be knocked over. Uh, what I'm going to paint next, as you can tell from the label, this is the set Heroes and Villains. So, take them all, then. Yeah, it seems so. And what we get here is a collection of... Oh, oh these are all individually packaged. One, two, three four, five, six guys. I can show you these two that are not in smaller bags. That are, they all have integrated bases, scenic bases, staircase, large piece of rock. They're all standing in poses and they're all pretty, have huge weapons. This, this guy is also standing on some sort of rock formation. He's got a big ass sword. Uh, this. Oh, again, on a rock, windswept cloak, big axe, uh, on top of some sort of tower with a, what is this, big sword strapped to his back, kneeling, and uh, some sort of daze. And a big shield, and what's this? yeah, this is an axe. So clearly, these are display models. What on earth possessed Meeper to make display models in Bonesium? That's <laughs> one of the dumbest ideas ever. Oh well, whatever. They made them, I bought them, I have to paint them. So obviously there's nothing in the new arrivals section this uh, episode because uh, that midweek update was only two days ago and uh, n of course nothing new has arrived during the weekend. Um, that was perhaps stupid of me to add that onto that video, but oh well, you live and you learn. Uh, I'd like to finish off this update by uh, thinking out loud about basis for a while. That seems to be the theme of this week, doesn't it? But this time it's from a different aspect, it's basing size. See, I'm thinking of, well, pretty much planning to uh, have my next big project be painting all of these strange Aeons miniatures, the ones I got with the Strange Aeons Kickstarter. And first off, you'll note that on these two I have tested scraping off the mole lines, and it seems to work well. I 
I've gotten most of it off cleanly, I think. Uh, again, let's see how much the camera picks up. Probably more than I can see with my eyes. Um, but then the question becomes, um, they all have these, these integral bases uh, cast into them, and they're all of a uniform size, so that seems like you could simply use them. Uh, and the pictures in the rule book from, from example games show them playing with just these bases, as far as I can tell. But the other minis that I have previously painted up with a sort of Cthuloid theme, I have all placed all of these on these uh, 30 millimeter lip bases. And there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Uh, just to show you, putting these onto the bases like this is really simple. It's not it's simply a matter of gluing them on in the middle and then perhaps filling out some material and some basing grit uh, to make it look even and nice. And the advantages are, well, number one, uniformity. Uh, I can use minis from other ranges than the street own range, and I can base them all the same, and they will all work together. Um, also, they're more stable, the bigger, the wider footprint. I can put some more uh, grass and stuff on the bases to make them look nicer if they're bigger. Uh, disadvantages, well, do they take up too much place space on the table? You have to f think of the fact that in Strange Aeons, the basic board size is only two by three feet. That's not a lot. Of, that's not a lot of real estate. Is it, am I increasing the footprint too much? I I don't think so because most games will have have at most half a dozen models per side. So. If, if they take up a few millimeters more of space, that's not a big thing. Oh, and I should note that I measured these. These are um, 18 millimeters as opposed to the 30. Well, if you want to be precise, these are more like 29, not, not a full 30. But anyway, that's an extra 12 millimeters. Um, does it matter for gameplay? Um, it depends. If you measure ranges from base to base, uh, you will get a little bit closer when it comes in terms of shooting. You gain uh, a tiny fraction of, of distance. Uh, I'm not sure that matters very much. The most important rule is probably the one about melee, because the the rule about melee is you have to get into base-to-base -base contact with your opponents, like so. So if we compare how close these are to how close these are, um, visually this looks better, because they're further apart, you can tell them apart. This looks very jumbled, not very aesthetic. Uh, the technical difference is the distance somebody needs to cover to charge. If this guy, uh, if th this guy is charging this guy, he needs to move a certain distance. Likewise, if he's charging her, he has to move a certain distance. And the distance increases if you uh, so decreases if you use the larger bases. The larger bases are. Uh, like I said, 12 millimeters more in uh, across, which is six millimeters on each side, which again becomes 12 millimeters total. Um, th these, if he's charging him, he needs to move 12 millimeters longer, further than if he does if charging her. And 12 millimeters is half an inch. Almost, not quite half an inch. Is that a lot? Considering movements in this game are, are on the size order of five inches or so, is an extra half inch important? Doesn't make melee 
occur more often? I'm not sure. I don't think so. I mean, when I play friendly games with people, we're not anal about measuring. You know, a few millimeters here and there, it's not a big deal. It's all approximate. Um, so, I don't, I'm not, I'm unsure. I'm, I'm leaning towards using the larger basis simply because, mostly because I think they look better and, and looks <laughs> sometimes matter more to me than rules, <laughs> honestly. But let me know what you think. Is it a big deal that uh, it'll make it a tiny sliver amount easier to get into melee with somebody? Those are my closing thoughts for this update. I will see you in my next video. Until then, I'm Doc Eon, signing off.